Good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, a wonderful Thursday, as always. Welcome back to Deering Live. It's been a few weeks because uh, we've been traveling for the first time in a while. Uh, I was out in Nashville at Summer Nam um, for a few days. Uh, that was about two weeks ago. And David and, in fact, Mr. Tony Trishka here were in Colorado attending Rocky Grass. Is that, uh, is that accurate? I would say that's pretty accurate. I would say that's pretty accurate, too. Yeah. Yep. Just got back. How was it? How was Rocky Grass? Because that's, I think, Dave, that's the first festival you've been to, right? For the year? Yeah, definitely. First festival of the year. Awesome. Was, how, was, how was the vibe it's, for you guys? It was, it was great to see Tony. Great to hear music. Great to see, you know, lots of lots of familiar faces. Yeah. It was, it was a wonderful cool. festival. Just an amazing lineup. And it was hot. But that's what happens in the summertime. So, but we had a great time. Yeah, lots of old friends and uh, reconnecting with folks. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and we've got a few more coming up. IBMA, uh, Melfest coming up uh, later in the year. Tony, have you probably got a few more to uh, to get to as well, right? What's, what's yeah, yeah, I've got a few more festivals and uh, doing uh, something called E Town. I just kind of solidified that today out in Boulder, I'm going back out to Colorado in November. So, I'm going to be doing E Town, which is this. Uh, nationally broadcast radio show with okay. Nick Forrester who used to be with, or actually still is with High Rise and a good friend. So anyway, lots of good stuff coming up. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah. uh, just a reminder to the audience as well, while, uh, while Dave was out at Rocky Grass, um, he managed to, to meet and greet with a bunch of, of wonderful people, including Mr. Tony Trishko and, and do a, a series of short interviews. Um, they are on our blog, uh, including Max Allard and Wes Corbett, Tony, obviously, um, Bruce Molsky was with you, I think. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Jake Sheps and a few others. So I'll put that link in the chat here in just a moment so people can go check that out at their, their leisure. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about you, Mr. Trishka. <laughs> Thank you. How about we do some of that? We're going to delve into all kinds of fun things, including uh, uh, your album. Um, and uh, obviously, as uh, this, this particular episode is presented by our good friends at uh, Artist Works. So we'll be talking about that some as well. Um, but as is tradition, do you want to kick off with a with a little tune for us? Sure. It's not as little as some, but it's uh, it's a medley of three tunes. The first is called John Henry, and uh, usually it goes to a five chord uh, midway through. But uh, there's a woman named Etta Baker, who's this African American and indigenous woman uh, from North Carolina, played Piedmont style guitar, and I'll play a tune by her later on, uh, and banjo wonderful musician and she went to a four chord where everyone else goes to a five chord so we incorporated that in this and then one called uh, bonaparte's retreat and then finishing off with a tune that i've written that still i even recorded it and gave it a name but i never remember the name because it didn't mean that much so we'll call it the deering artist works interface breakdown thank you very much <laughs> for lack of away, that. <laughs> all right here we go Thank you. 
All right. Fantastic, Tony. Thank you. That, that was mostly in detuning, right? Yeah, here's G tuning. Third string goes down from B to A. Third string goes, second string goes from B to A. The third string goes from G to F sharp, and the fifth string is up in A. But now okay. we get back in G tuning. I have these Keith tuners on here. You get those fancy bends. Exactly. Well, we're going to be uh, covering a number of topics today, but um, uh, one of them we're going to focus on is, is your your new album, Shall We Hope. Um, it's a fantastic album, and uh, um, and we're going to get into it in detail later. But do you want to just start us off with just a little overview of the album, its origins and its themes? Well, it started about twelve years ago, and um, I'd written a couple of written lyrics for a couple of tunes on my previous album called Great Big World, and was really enjoying that suddenly everything is three-dimensional when you have lyrics and having written many many banjo tunes i wanted to try my hand at writing some lyrics i'd say with almost every album that i've ever done there's maybe one song on each one of the lyrics but i wanted to get a little more expansive this time on this one so anyway i decided to write a song based about on a riverboat gambler uh, because i find the mid-1800s that era to be fascinating and wrote you know created this character and wrote a song about him uh and then that led to, um, well, maybe I'll try to write another song. And then uh, I had written this banjo instrumental that I uh, put some words to about the great train robbery during the Civil War in 1862. And then I started thinking, well, maybe this is developing into something. And it just kind of grew from there, from those two songs. And uh, I had another banjo tune that I'd written and put lyrics to about a woman coming from Ireland uh, during the potato famine and getting on a coffin ship as they called them to to the americas and uh and then it just again just kept building and building and i wanted to have uh, the aspect of uh, slavery and enslaved africans uh brought into it and i had a chance to go to um i was visiting a friend in Asheville, north carolina and uh the husband of my friend who's a history professor at Warren Wilson College, where the Swannanoa gathering takes place, said that he and his uh, students had been clearing shrubbery and brush from uh, a slave graveyard on, on the outskirts of Asheville, and I'd like to go there the next morning. And I said, I certainly would. And it was a very powerful experience. It was right behind this church, and uh, it was fairly clear to the shrubbery, but there were just these rocks on the ground. And I said, what are those? And he said, those are indicating that someone was buried there before the end of the Civil War. There would be no grave markers. And this was a, an enslaved graveyard. And a gentleman named George Avery, who was enslaved, was the, uh, was the grave digger. And so these stones dated from back then, from the 1840s and 50s, let's say. Uh, and it was just a really powerful experience. And I went back uh, to the place where I was staying with this professor and his wife and wrote a tune that night. Uh, and that began this portion of the album, which there are about four tunes that uh, deal with that aspect of the Civil War and the pre-Civil War in this case. And so it was just this constantly evolving thing, even after it was done. Oh, wait, I have one more thing I'd like to do. And it was like, you got to stop at some point because there's so many stories, many of which people don't know about. And uh, you can just unearth amazing uh, situations and write about them so anyway that's in a long nutshell <laughs> how it developed and was when that experience of of being in the the graveyard um was that where you started writing about um the the african-american banjo um meat tune um the, the, that is on the album is that is that 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 came out of that yeah out of that experience okay yeah because minstrelsy for all of its offensive aspects such as you know white folks corking up and going into blackface and all that uh, the music itself was many times taken from uh black musicians joel sweeney was credited as being the first white to play the banjo uh, lived in Appomattox, Virginia, and growing up, he loved the music 
of the enslaved people in his area. And he would listen to their music, their dances, watch their dances and uh, learn their stories. And he developed his own gourd bonza, which I happen to have one right here. As it turns out, this is made by a friend of mine in Arkansas, but he found a gourd, this gentleman, Joel Sweeney, and uh, fashioned a rough hewn neck and yanked some hair from the family's horse's mane, twined it together with beeswax and created strings and killed the family cat for the head. This is a plastic head, I should point that out. No animal has been harmed for this. Um, and his mother was very displeased, needless to say, and destroyed his rudimentary bonza, as it was called, a predecessor to the banjo. And then uh, he had to kill the family, second family cat to create his second bonza. And his mother decided to let him just continue playing the banjo. And he started one of the very first minstrel shows in the 1840s and played for the crown heads of Europe, including Queen Victoria, who gave, gave him a gold purse to hold his coins in. So uh, it goes, you know, it goes all the way back. It goes all the way back to Africa, actually. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But um, anyway, it's, it's something that uh, I think is really important and important for people to know about uh, as well, that there's this whole black experience that informs, uh, well, so much of popular music and uh, right. you know, bluegrass, Joel Sweeney, um, um, Bill Monroe, uh, boy, I'm not going to remember his name, but there was a black blues street musician in Rosine, Kentucky, where Bill Monroe grew up and came to maturity. Arnold Schultz was his name. He played fiddle and guitar, and Bill Monroe always credits him with teaching him the blues, which is such an important part of bluegrass music. And you could go on and on. Jimmy Rogers, and et cetera, et cetera. The Carter family had black influence in their music, and the music they found. So. Um. You're holding that banjo now. Do I almost want to I, I, you almost play said, something? <laughs> that might be a good idea, huh? Yeah. So this is this is low tuned, theoretically down in D. Yeah, just about D, and it's fretless. So, and I'm going to play two tunes. Uh, the very first banjo instruction book was written in 1855, and by a guy named Tom or Thomas Briggs, and the first tune in there is a tune called Juba which was this uh, dance that would be done by the enslaved people in the West Indies. It was also the name of the first black to dance and perform in minstrel shows. And it's also this kind of, I can't do it with something like that, but this kind of hand padding thing. Uh, that's also called doing juba. And I'm not sure which of those gave this song its title. It's a simple melody, but um, has various rhythmic variations. And it's undoubtedly of African origin. And I'm going to do that and then go into a tune that's the earliest example of black banjo music that I could find dating from no later than 1850. Uh, a street musician in Elmira, New York played it. And it appeared in a magazine uh, in the 1880s uh, by this white minstrel player who he said that was his influence was hearing this black street musician. And the music is there. It doesn't give the tuning. So I had to kind of figure out what the tuning would be, which I think I've got here. And it's two finger, uh, it's in a two finger style. The first I'm gonna do is more of a downstroke style, which is how the minstrel players were playing in the 1850s and into the 1860s. Uh, so it's starting with Juba and then this other tune, which is unfortunately unnamed, but there was no name given for it, but both examples of black banjo music.
And how old is that? How old is that chord banjo? I'd say it's 20 years old, thereabouts. Okay. Like okay. That. Yeah. Well, the banjo has been your 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 primary tool, not your sole tool, but for for your creativity. Um, but it but it hasn't just been limited to instrumental music. We've, you've, you've talked about at the beginning. You talked about how you included on almost every album at least one track with uh with lyrics on it right. how how is the banjo kind of have you used the banjo to express your creativity you know in other ways other than just instrumentally but also as a storyteller and a lyricist and a writer and a teacher that's a big topic <laughs> yeah uh well as i said um the couple of tunes on the album um were written as banjo tunes and then i decided to i can turn this into a um I can turn this into a lyrical song. I can write lyrics to this. Uh, back in 2010, actually, um, I was going to write a tune a day for a year. I was going to give myself that assignment. I made it to February. So I had about, you know, 45 tunes or something like that. And just had to go on the road and just lost the, lost the thread. But uh, going back through some of those tunes, uh, I found this one tune that was... Um, uh, I decided to put lyrics to which became this great train robbery song. Or, uh, it's called The General, which is the name of the train that was hijacked by Union spies in North Georgia. Uh, and then there's this other one um, was written on a, a cello banjo, and uh, which is an octave banjo tune from G down to low G, an octave lower, and had kind of a Celtic flavor, and that became the basis for this song, Carry Me Over the Sea. So uh those became the vehicles for these lyrical songs um and of course for teaching it's uh, you know i started teaching in 1970 there was a group called the buffalo gals originally the buffalo chip kickers the buffalo gals in syracuse new york where i grew up and lived till i was about 23 and their banjo player in the group said uh, i'd never taught before she said will you give me lessons and i said well i, I don't teach she said that's okay i won't pay you so um and that was fine. And then uh, that got me started teaching. And, and the second lesson I had was with the guitar player in her group. And that woman, Martha Trachtenberg, said, uh, I'd like lessons too. And I said, well, I'm really hardly teaching. She said, okay, my grandmother sends me chocolate chip cookies from time to time. I'll pay you with chocolate chip cookies. That sounded like a pretty good deal. And I still don't earn any money from teaching. I just get cookies and do it for, no, that's not true. Uh, anyway. But that's how I got started teaching. But I'd say I learn an awful lot from teaching. And obviously, I, you know, if I'm going to teach banjo, I, I need ban a banjo. And um, uh, and so, but teaching, my father was a physics professor, so I guess it's somewhat in the gene pool. Uh, I never thought I followed in his footsteps, certainly not with physics, but, uh, you know, just teaching and uh, with artist works, uh, you know, I, I've... I started teaching just private lessons for a bunch of years, but after about five years, I put out a, band, a book called Melodic Banjo. Uh, Pete Warnick had written a book called Bluegrass Banjo for Oak Publications and wanted me to, they wanted him to write another book and he was sort of burned out on that book. So he said, why don't we get Tony Trishka to write a book? And I'd never written a book before, but I ended up writing this book called Melodic Banjo. And that got me started. I've written about 15 instruction books over the years um, and, and done some, uh, various instructional material for homespun tapes and some other companies. And, uh, and now of course with artist works, it's all done online, which has been you know, just such a blessing during the pandemic and continues to be. So I've been doing it for about 10 years and, uh, it's, you know, just, we have a wonderful community and it keeps me coming up with new ideas for the students. It's not like a book where you write it and it's done and you can forget about it and move on. This is an ongoing thing. Every day I'm coming up with new ideas and I'm actually going out to uh, Napa, California on Monday uh, to film a whole bunch of new lessons, which is the first time in two years. And usually I go out every six months, but because of the pandemic, I've been unable to do that. So anyway. That's... And why don't you talk a little bit about how ArtistWorks is, is uh, unique in that it's not just video lessons and that that lesson you know students can get some feedback as well um right there's uh something that uh 
they came up with David Butler. It's Patricia and David Butler are the people that really created it, particularly David. And uh, he came up with this uh, concept of what are called video exchanges. And basically people can send in a video and it's not like a Skype lesson, it's not in real time, but they send a video in that goes into a queue and I respond to it. And I can pretty quickly, you know, see, okay, someone needs to work on their timing or they're not playing all the notes clearly or whatever it is, things, so things that people might not be aware of unto themselves. Uh, and some sometimes it takes as much as 20 minutes to really analyze what's going on and uh, give all the pointers that I want to give. Uh, other times people will just play something perfectly and, and I'll laud them for it. And, uh, you know, that's a fairly short one. But what I do with just about every, uh, with rare exceptions, just about every um, response that I do, I do a variation on the tune that they've sent in. So there's a little extra material there. And anyone on the site, even if they don't send in a video, there's no requirement to send in a video, but if you want to, and that's the best way to get feedback. Um, and so that's highly recommend that people do that. But anyone on the site can look at this. There's a library of video exchanges going back 10 years. And I've done, I think, over 9,000 so far. So there's a huge amount of material there. People can go to the end of my response, which is where I always get my uh, variations. And sometimes for an entire A part of a tune, it's the whole part. Sometimes it's just a lick. It depends. Uh, and plus, I've got over 50 interviews there with Bela and I, Bela Fleck, that is. It's sort of like Madonna or, is, you know, Prince, you know, one name people, Bela. Uh, <laughs> I interviewed uh, Earl, another one name presence. Uh, we did a double uh, interview with him. And at one point in the interview, Earl was talking about with his thumb pick that he he would cut grooves in his thumb pick this way uh, where the bottom of the thumb goes so it would stay on the, on the thumb better. And I said, Earl, can I borrow your thumb pick and just try it out? And he said, sure. And he hands me his thumb pick. And I played a couple of roles. And I'm thinking, holy crap, I've got Earl Scruggs' thumb pick on my thumb. When I was you know, 14 years old learning to play, I never thought that would happen. Uh, that's, it was so exciting. Uh, but, but anyway, so, and then there's interviews with Steve Martin and Allison Brown and uh, B.B. Bowness, who's playing with a group called Mile 12, and she's unbelievable. She's like monstrous up the neck, you know, all over the place up the neck. And I asked her, B.B., how, how, how are you so fluent up the neck? She said, well, I, I live up there because my, my fingers are smaller and it's easier because the frets are closer. So I said, wow. There's, so any of you with small fingers, play up here. That's the, that's the tip. The trick. Uh, anyway, so there are all these interviews because uh, everyone has a different viewpoint on, on things. You know, Sonny Osborne, Alan, not Alan Sheldon, Alan Mundy. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, Pete Seeger. Um, and then there are shouts and forums where people can, you know, communicate with each other. And it's a really nice community. And, and in more recent times, people have hard times. You know, someone in their family has uh, health issues and they, they, they mentioned on the site and there's a lot of support from everyone else uh, for that person, what they're going through. It really has become a really wonderful community. So uh, That's fantastic. Yeah, I know we're selling artist works here, but it really is. It's a pretty yeah, amazing yeah, yeah. thing that they've got going here. And, and it's it's not just you know you have all levels there you have beginners and it, material for beginners intermediate uh advanced also and then you have it's not just bluegrass too you have you you've you know primarily it's three finger but then you have like classic banjo and and some other styles can you talk about some of the other styles and also how do you discern when you're making content like what is good for an advanced player and what's good for an intermediate player Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's technically bluegrass banjo, but I have so many other interests uh, as well. And so um, there's a, as you say, a classic banjo component to it, which is music that dates kind of coming out of the minstrel era, um, you know, from like, let's say the 1870s to the 1920s, and people still play it. Uh, a lot of music written for the banjo, a lot of parlor music. Uh, marches, rags, like classical music, some of the very earliest Edison cylinders featured banjo music. A guy named Bess Osman uh, and another guy named Fred Van Epps, they were the two leading lights. And the earliest example of recorded banjo music was from 1892, which is really going back. Uh, in fact, I had a chance to go to the Edison Museum here in New Jersey because I heard that they were 
doing uh, uh, that kind of recording again. Uh, and I went, wow, I could do a cylinder recording. And I called someone up and went down there and actually, and I wrote a tune uh, in a classic style and recorded it on the cylinder where <laughs> you're hearing that kind of sound going on. Yeah. And they've got the needle on and all this wax is getting peeled off. It was a pretty amazing experience. But And then there's some old time finger picking uh, tunes on there. That's another section. There's a, some claw hammer there. And I have a guy named Bob Carlin, who's one of the greatest uh, claw hammer players in the world, uh, do a, a series of lessons on claw hammer for beginners. And there's a Celtic section also. Uh, so it just kind of goes on and on. And there's a section of 13 or 14 lessons by um, about banjo setup also. So the, it's uh, it's a, it's a wide world of banjos, and I'd say they're almost approaching 300 lessons. Again, if you've never played the banjo, it's like how to hold the banjo. It goes that that far back. So, uh, and then doing Noel McKelney's version of uh, um, Cherokee Shuffle and some Bela things, and it's and everything in between. And it's it's a little hard to say who's a beginner, who's a, uh, intermediate, who's advanced. I just did a four day academy out of this Rocky Rest Festival before, before playing at the festival, and people sort of self-identify, okay, I'm a beginner, but maybe they're actually intermediate or some intermediates are more beginners. So, uh, but people can jump in wherever they want to try it, you know, see a, see a video of the, this particular lesson. And there's tablature for everything as well. And these are three camera shoots generally, sometimes overhead also. Uh, and people can just identify, uh, okay, I think I'm a beginner, and but they might find it really easy and then they can move on. But there's little pointers that they might have missed along the way. So. Well, we, I know there's a uh, there's a discount code for for people watching today. Um, if, if we want to get that up on the screen, there we go. So use uh, the code during twenty five for twenty five percent discount for a year uh, for Tony's School at Artist Works. Um, definitely check it out. It's a fantastic as uh, it's a fantastic community. It's not it's not a big pitch. It it really is is great, and the content there is just is wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, should I play another tune, or whatever. Yeah, should play another tune. You got your Deering signature model in your hand there, yes, and uh, that. it's the golden. Why don't you play another tune with that? Yeah. Let's see here. Um, this is um, a tune I wrote that ended up on my second to most recent album. The album's called Great Big World. And I had a friend of mine arrange this for, uh, I guess you call it a chamber quintet, uh, cello, violin, uh, oboe, flute, and viola. And I had Emil Washburn sing a vocal on it. I wrote a short number of lyrics for this which I will not sing for you, but the tune is called Lost.
lost. Since I'm in this tuning, I thought I might play uh, another tune. Sure. What tuning is it? Tuning. Sorry? What tuning is it? This is double C tuning, where okay. if you're in G tuning, the fourth string goes from D down to C, and the second string goes up from B to C. It's really a beautiful tuning. There's so much you can do in this tuning. Um, I'm going to go into drop C tuning, which is... G tuning, set the four string down in C. Just talking a little bit more about black banjo music, there was a gentleman named Gus Cannon uh, who recorded in 1927, 28, right around in there. He, he was from Memphis and he was a banjo player and he had the Cannon Jug Stompers. And jug band music was big in Memphis at that time. There was another band called the Memphis Jug Band. And if you're not familiar with Jug bands. There was a guy, uh, guy named Jim Questing who had a jug band in the '60s into the '70s, and Bill Keith, the inventor, one of the inventors of the melodic style, but certainly the popularizer. And who did, you know, a good huge percentage of what I play is thanks to Bill Keith, one of my still big heroes. But um, it started in the, in the late '20s, and people would grab a guitar and a banjo and a jug. Uh, like a porcelain jug, and uh, they might have a kazoo or a washboard for percussion. And so I'm listening to these old recordings of Gus Cannon, and it says he played jug and banjo at the same time, and most jug players would have to kind of hold it. Right. And I finally saw a photo of him, and he's got this harmonica rack kind of a deal with a jug in it, so he could play and play jug and banjo at the same time. And to play playing jug is sort of like playing bass. And uh, I'm going to spit in my hand for a second because I don't have the jug in front of me. But do, 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 do. that sort of thing. You get the idea. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, but Gus Cannon was an amazing banjo player and played in a ragtime style. And I'm going to start with one called the Hollywood Rag. I'm going to play two tunes starting with the Hollywood Rag. second song is called the Madison Street Rag and of great interest is the fact that this was recorded in 1928 and he does this rhythm now if you're a fan of Earl Scruggs you know a tune called ground speed where he goes recorded in 1959-1960 on an album that every banjo player should know called Foggy Mountain Banjo so Here's Gus Cannon in 1928 going. It's exactly the same rhythm, and it's exactly alternating single notes and pinched notes as Earl's doing pinch, single pinch, single pinch. Same exact, same exact rhythm, same concept of every other note is a pinched or a single note. And here it is. Uh, 30 years or even a little more than 30 years before Earl Scruggs did it. And I wish I knew where Earl got that. So this is very interesting, these, these parallels. Once I started working on this. Wait a second, that's ground speed. So You hear that rhythm in, uh, in a lot of like 
swing fiddle uh, huh? tunes too, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a swing. It's a yeah. ragtime. Yeah, it's a, kind of a conceit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I'm not sure where, I'll go. but just the fact, not just the rhythm, but actually the way he's playing it is almost exactly. Even though the chord is different, the the approach is exactly the same. So I just found that fascinating. And when was kind of the height of of ragtime banjo on the five string banjo? Um, was it pre recorded? Was it in the nineteenth century more? No, it was it was right around nineteen hundred. You could say um, around the same time as as ragtime piano. Yeah. Well, and um, what's his name? The ragtime piano king. Uh, um, uh, you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Is, <laughs> not not to get too niche and about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Jelly Roll come. Morton, but before before Jelly Roll Morton. Um, yes, yeah, you yes. know we can. Yes. Maple Leaf Rag, that guy. Maple Leaf Rag, that guy. Yes, yes. his mother. The Entertainer. Was, sorry, and the Entertainer. The entertainer. <laughs> his mother was a banjo player too, so it all goes back to the banjo. Yeah. Um, Scott Joplin. <laughs> thank you, Scott Joplin. <laughs> Scott Joplin, um, and. He, he uh yeah it was simultaneous all that stuff was happening around the same time late 1800s 1900 i could play one tune from that era if we have the time sure Sure. yeah i haven't practiced this in a long time let me see it just i just want to see if i can get get through this uh it's called the kansas jig and there'd be the song folios for these tunes it would be either the main lead banjo part and then a banjo part, uh, a harmony banjo part or backup banjo part, or there'd be sheet music for piano also. And this was all written out for sheet music. And there would be some indications as in tablature where there might be uh, an X for the thumb, one dot for the index and two dots for the middle finger. And if you were borrowing at the fifth fret, it would say uh, five PB position bar and if you were using just your index finger on a particular string, like on the second string, fifth fret, it would say 5P, meaning fifth fret uh, with the index finger. And you'd have to know what the note is. This happens to be an E note. So if you see an E note on the music and it says 5P, you know where to go. It's the fifth fret of that second string. So there were some indications, not with all of it, but a lot of the music had those kind of indications. So here's the Kansas jig. through it i knew it was taking a little bit of a chance there but you get the idea (laughs) and it's in c minor too um which is not exactly standard standard placement for a tune i mean let me try this last part one more time let's see if i can get, get it back in my memory
there you have it. Pardon the train wreck. Nice, nice. Looking at that, the way it seems like that tune is kind of a lot of chord shapes, a lot of, and and then you're just kind of arpeggiating through it with a little, you know, a little lick here and there on top of a chord shape. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In other words, this whole last section that I <laughs> fell off the banjo on, uh, um, like that's a, an A flat or G sharp chord right here. You're borrowing the first. Uh, friend of the first three strings. And then E flat, C, and then B flat to an E flat chord in D position. And, and you're arpeggiating these chords. Does so that help you memorize rather than trying to m remember each note individually? Does it kind of help you memorize by, by thinking of it as a chord melody where you're really just arpeggiating through a chord and, and, and knowing the little licks there? Or are you, are you remembering each individual note? I remember every note. It drives me crazy, <laughs> I tell you. No, um, I don't think of it. I know it is arpeggiating chords, but I don't mm -hmm. think of it in those terms. I just think of it you know, just in the, the musical sense of it, how it sounds to my ear, uh, as opposed to, okay, there's an E flat chord, there's a B flat chord, and, you know, just remember these chords. Um, that's how my brain works anyway. Sure. I just, and I memorize just by playing them over and over and over again. Right. If you're playing something like Scrug style, I think it's helpful if you think about what are the roles that are involved in this. If you take something like, a, since I'm in this tuning, this drop C tuning, which is very, very common, even starting in the 1850s, the first banjo instruction book, the banjos were tuned down in D, as my gourd bonza was, and the fourth string would be tuned down to G, which is a fourth below D, as in G tuning, C is a fourth below G. So it's the same relative tuning. And it started off in low D, and then even by 1858, the second and third banjo books that came out were raised up in E, and stayed that way pretty much till the end of the century. And then right around 1900, they start going into uh, G tuning. And Snuffy Jenkins, who considered himself to be the first person on the radio to play three finger style with finger picks. And he was friendly with Earl Scruggs and they hung out together and went to fiddle contests together. And I had a chance to interview Snuffy a couple of times. I was supposed to be playing a, a date with the um, the violent femmes who are not violent and they're guys, but uh, sort of folk punk or something you can almost say. And I recorded it on one of their albums and I was going to play with them and our set was uh, at one in the morning or something like that. And uh, we had, a, I was with a friend of mine, Barry Mitterhoff, and we were going to go to see a movie or something uh, to kill the time between the sound check and the show. And I opened up the paper, and there's Snuffy Jenkins and Pappy Sherrill playing in New York City that night. And we hailed six cabs before we found one that knew where White Street was downtown and got down there and got to see Snuffy Jenkins just by happen chance. And I interviewed him the next day and got to play his banjo, which is just about the best sounding banjo I ever played because it had a pick guard on it. And during you should consider putting pick guards on all your banjos. It's just a thought. Because when you touch the head, you're killing the tone of the banjo, the vibrations just a little bit. With a pick guard, you're raised just off the, the, uh, the head, and the banjo just resonates like crazy. But where I'm going with this, after this great digression, is that Snuffy Jenkins tuned his banjo up to A. Open tuning was A instead of G. So maybe, you know, 10 years from now, it'll be up in B or something. Who knows? But um, in terms of memorizing things and roles and things like that, if you take something like uh, Earl's version of Home Sweet Home. All of the, those are all backward rolls. Everyone was backward, 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 backward. backward. And then he goes into a forward roll. He 
did a lot of this sort of thing if you take something like Farewell Blues. <laughs> about that you can lose yourself in the backward rolls if you're not careful it was that six or seven backward rolls and the coolest thing about this that note right there he's in the key of c he's hitting a c sharp note this is recorded for mercury records flat and scruggs 1950 ish and he was like 27 or 28 somewhere in that neighborhood at that point and he just thought i like that sound that is bizarre you're playing a c sharp note against c just one tiny example of the many, many multifarious things that Earl came up with. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Well, bring it back to the, uh, bring it kind of a, a little bit back to the album. You use a lot of, um, a, a number of different banjos on, on the album. Right. And they all kind of, you know, have different nuances that help tell the story. Um, how do you decide w what is used on, on, you know, at what time. Right. Uh, yeah, there's some, I use uh, one of your competitors' banjos. I won't mention the uh, the, the company, but uh, uh, I had written this tune on cello banjo, yeah. uh, as I mentioned before, and decided to use that because it was Celtic to use it as the basis for the song, uh, Carry Me Over the Sea, which I was really fortunate to have Maura O'Connell sing, who's one of the greatest singers in the world. I first saw her with a group called the Dannon. Uh, in the early 80s, I guess. Um, and then I played a tune on this banjo. I was trying to write, I wanted to write a march. And, um, you know, in a, basically write my own Civil War march. And I listened to, uh, I mean, there are all these recreationists that they have these brass bands playing, you know, literally the music that was uh, played during the Civil War. And so I use this band. So this is, it's a Vega um, Little Wonder that uh, it's made by Deering because Deering owns the Vega name now. And uh, Greg and Janet were kind enough to um, uh, lend this to me when I was playing in San Diego at the Grammy Museum to a solo show. And I wanted an extra banjo to play. And they strung this up in nylon strings and brought it to me. And uh, let me take it home with me, actually. And I've never returned it. I hope you're not watching. But um, I ended up playing this kind of in the classic style because I wouldn't because there were no banjos being played along with the brass bands back then. But since it was a banjo, in fact, I was not even going to play on this. I was fortunate to have one of my big culture heroes, a guy named Van Dyke Parks, arrange this uh, for an eight-piece band. You know, horns and drums and uh, tuba and that sort of thing. And uh, and I was talking to him about it. By the way, he has an album out called Song Cycle from 1966 or seven, that I think is one of the most ingenious uh, albums ever made. But, um, you know, I was saying, Van Dyke, just let's just have the, the horn thing. He said, no, no, it's your album. You should play some banjo on it. So, uh, so, it's called the Big Round Top March because the Battle of Gettysburg figures in the uh, quite largely in the the story of Shall We Hope. And uh, let's see if I can get through this without the uh, eight piece band.
Nice. Um, we have a couple of people commenting about the bridge on that banjo. Um, do, what, how, what do you think that bridge plate, um, can, how, how does it contribute to the sound? Well, it says patent pending. I don't know who he is, but or she is. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Jens Kruger apparently came up with this little concept here. And it's, I'm not even sure what it's made of. It just came with a banjo when, when the fine Deering folks gave this to me. Um, but it, what it does, it adds sustain to the banjo. You get, I'm not sure if it's coming across that way out there, but it definitely has a lot more sustain. And I'm not even sure what it's called, but it's some, it's not the bridge itself, but the bridge sits on top of it. And again, it just adds more sustain to the sound. It, it, it doesn't give us quite, quite as much um, ringing or resonance because it's sitting right on top of the head, but it does add some sustain and it's a really nice sound. So thank you, Jens Kruger for that. Yeah, we call it the the bridge plate. Uh, it, it was uh, thank you, and um, now I know. It, it's 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 it isn't fixed to the head. It's still floating, just like just like a, a standard bridge, you know, by the tension of the strings. Um, right. I mean, um, yes, it's brilliant because he also came up with the smile bridge. It's my understanding that was his concept also. He's always tinkering. You know, he's always he's always always striving for uh, you know to make the banjo sound better. Yeah, which is what this bridge is here. I don't know if we can see that very well. Um, what it does is the bridge, rather than being flat, is rounded. Because when you put a bridge on the banjo, you know, the head's not absolutely tight. And it'll sink a little bit and you lose a little contact with the feet of the bridge. And by having the, the bridge rounded like this on the feet, they, they fit right in that pocket. And it creates greater contact between the bottom of the bridge and the head. And I just... Found the first time I put one on here. On here, I, I know I'm shilling for Deering, and I, I hate to be doing that so overtly commercially, but I really believe in these things. Um, I, I started playing; it was so loud and rich and full and powerful. Alan Mundy was sitting, you know, 100 feet away, and he kind of looked over. It. What was that? What's that? I mean, he commented to me afterwards uh, how amazing the sound was after doing that. So, um, anyway, thank you, Jens Kruger, for coming up with both of those. It's always nice when you when you just change in something on your instrument or change instruments and somebody else notices it too. It's right. not just you know you you know losing your <laughs> losing your marbles and, and talking yourself <laughs> into it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We had a good question from from uh, R Dub on on the on the chat. He says, "When Tony is playing, is he playing in the moment or is he thinking about what notes are next?" Wow, that's, that's a really good question. It depends on the tune. Uh, a lot of what I've played so far is all worked out beforehand. I, mean, I haven't done much improvising for these particular tunes. And it depends on what it is. Um, a lot of the time I am just improvising. Probably most of the time at gigs I am. If I do solo gigs, I have a lot of that worked out. Uh, but when I do gigs with bands, I have a trio with Bruce Molsky and Michael Daves right now. We're doing a lot of work. Uh, it's not the only thing I'm doing, but it's one of the things I do, and it's really fun. And a lot of the things I play, in, if I play a fiddle tune, it tends to be worked out a lot of the time. But a lot of the things I do are not. Um, and it brings up a whole thing that Miles Davis apparently once said to his musicians, play what you don't know. And that's kind of, well, how do you do that? Uh, how do you play what you don't know? I mean, like recreate everything like forget everything you know and play something else whatever that might be and then chick korea comment on commented on that and we certainly miss chick who passed not that long ago and he said that um what and he played for miles in the on bitches brew and these other albums around 1970 and he said what he thought miles meant was don't plan what you're going to play because uh, there's this i can't remember his name right now but the jazz saxophonist was saying how when he improvises, he always hears in his head what's about to come next. And what Chick was saying, Miles was saying, was don't, and there are different approaches, not that one is better than another, but uh, the Miles was saying, don't even plan, just let the music flow out however it comes out. And that tends to be how I play. You know, if I'm playing a straight ahead bluegrass tune, I'll, I'll be having the melody in my mind, but I'll often go in different places. 
uh, and it, it's funny because I've always played that way. And a few years ago, I was uh, about to take a solo and I thought, wait, I have no idea what I'm about to play. I won't say I got nervous, but it was like, whoa, whoa. And, uh, and it worked out, but I've always done that, but it's, I suddenly became aware of it. And it, it, it disturbed me a little bit, shall we say. And I'm just sort of relaxed about it again, fortunately. But one thing that I think is really good for all players to do is to free improvise. Um, and you can be an absolute beginner. And just start playing with no preconceived notions. It might be a Scruggsy thing, if that's where your musical base is, or it can be anything. Um, I had a chance to play with a drummer near where I live here in New Jersey, and he wanted to do something called free grass, which was with me. He was a percussionist, and uh, Andy Statman, this incredible mandolin player uh, who I played with over the years. And he wanted to get the three of us together. And I said, so do you have charts? He said, no, no, we're just going to totally free improvise. And we did a gig in New York City at the city, um, at the um, knitting factory. And we played two 45 minute sets with no plan whatsoever. We just started playing and interacting and listening to each other. And after five or 10 minutes, we just stopped playing because we, we felt together that was the end of it. And it was all totally free. And then I played a regular gig the next night and I was so opened up from doing that free improvising. My ideas were flowing like crazy, even when I was playing a little more straight ahead. So I think it's a great way for everyone to exp express their musicality. And I'll try to do just a little bit of that right now. Hopefully being in tune. That's something to, you can you can try. Yeah, I love that stuff. I do that a fair amount of that stuff too. Do you? But there's a fair, fairly good free improv team going so, You play with a free improv group? Yeah, they, they put people together, various people together randomly, and then and then you just wow. play. Um, but the banjo seems to work quite well for the free improv thing because well, one, it's an open tuning right there. So right. you the hard part is trying to get out of that tuning is, mm -hmm. is not to just kind of fall into playing everything in G or C or something like that. Um, right. Um, that's the, that's, that's the fine. Part. I'm sorry. Yeah. When you're playing with other, other instrument instrumentalists, there's sometimes they say, are we doing another one in G? <laughs> 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 no, please no. <laughs> right. Well, Jamie, you're, you jumped in here. Uh, I did, I did, I did. I, um, <laughs> I always have something to say. First of all, I was uh, I was 
um, I know we've covered this a couple of times on different episodes. I nearly jumped in during the Smarbridge conversation, but uh, I will just demonstrate really, really quick for those of you that are bored of me doing this now, but I'm going to anyway. If you can see that, see at the top of it, this is an old flat bridge. And you can kind of see the top of it is, is curved very slightly. Uh, and the reason for that is is because the string tension is is pushing down on the on the on the bridge, and the bottom of it likes to kind of conform to the bottom of the head. Um, I'm not sure if that's clear or not, but that's the idea. What Tony's talking about is that the bottom on a small bridge is is pre curved, and the top remains flat. So this doesn't happen, and it remains a constant contact with the head. So just thought I'd share that. Um, but uh, I did also want to bring it back to the album just a little bit before we kind of start to, to wrap up, if we may. I kind of feel like you uh, we've we got to delve a little bit more. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So, I mean, it, it, it focuses, and the album's called Shall We Hope. It focuses, you know, on the struggles of, of the Civil War. Um, it feels to me like there's more to the story than maybe you were able to fit in to us to a, a one single album um is that accurate or and is there more stuff that maybe you want to explore that you haven't uh and if so like are you are there plans to that's my question well i'm not going to do a second shall we hope but as i was saying before that just when i thought i was done something else i found something else one thing that i wanted to include and couldn't find uh there's a character named Maura Kinnear, played by or sung by Maura O'Connell. And, you know, the Civil War is all about, not all about, but primarily about the men that fought this war on both sides. But there are stories of the women at home, and there's a song on there um, where it's, I found letters from soldiers back to their wives on both sides. And uh, I, I conflated the stories and had Maura sing as if it's from a uh, husband to the one husband to the wife, even though I conflated various letters. Um, and one thing while searching out these letters, I found a letter from a woman to her husband who was at war talking about how hard it is. Yes, I know you're suffering, you're in the war, but I'm raising three children here and we have no money. We're, we're running out of money here and I've got to take credit at the local general store. That sort of a letter. And I, I wanted to include that. So there was, there was a little bit more from the woman's point of view. Um, and I was unable to, re I found it and never, you know, put it in my computer. So I'm going to, I'm hoping to do a theatrical, some sort of theater piece to this at some point in the future. Uh, it's, it's a ways off, but I'm hoping I, I will get a chance to do that. And then I can add some of these things. And also very recently I found, uh, well, on the album, there's a letter from a guy named John Boston to his, to his wife. He's escaped from his enslaver, and his wife is still in slavery. And he's writing to her, and it's a very emotional thing uh, on the album. Um, but I recently found a letter from a woman who was enslaved, and she escaped. And she's writing to her husband, who I believe is still enslaved. So I wanted to kind of have them writing to each other and, and have a back and forth between them so the answer is yes there's always more there are more stories to be told and uh and i hope someday to be able to explore that that sounds like it will be exciting yeah it's it's such a profound uh album as well the, all the music to it and the stories that go along with it it's it's so so fascinating uh my wife went down a pretty major rabbit hole of um genealogy and kind of trace her, her roots all the way back uh you know to the revolution and Right. civil war and that kind of stuff so it's it, it's the similar stories that come out of there so it's i find it really interesting but um um how do you think that the message i guess the message of struggle that, that shall we hope kind of resonates throughout um how do you think it relates to issues of today as we, as we live through this kind of very very strange time do you have any well, parallels there I think there are parallels. It wasn't intended to be this, but there, there are a couple of different parallels. I'll start with one, which was I wrote this Christmas tune on there. Uh, Christmas cheer this weary year about how we, we can't celebrate Christmas with our loved ones, which and the album came out uh, in Jan this past January and the single came out in December just before Christmas. We did a video on it. 
And at that point, people were not traveling to their loved ones. So because of the pandemic, uh, so it was particularly uh, prescient, even though I didn't intend it to be that, that people in the Civil War couldn't get back together because the soldiers were at war, et cetera. But in the larger sense of things, one of the important finds while I was, you know, researching aspects of the of this album, uh, I found a video from 1938 of a 75th reunion of surviving soldiers who were at the Battle of Gettysburg, both sides, Confederate and Union. And there you see people getting, these gentlemen getting off these trains, some are able to walk, some are in wheelchairs, some with canes. One person does a little jig almost, a little bit of a dance. Uh, and again, they're in their late 80s into their 90s. And there's in some in many cases, they're wearing their actual uniforms that they still had from uh, 1863 when they were at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but there's a scene in this newsreel of the two sides shaking hands or on either side of a stone wall at Gettysburg where they had fought 75 years before. And here they are shaking hands over the wall. And it was just a really powerful experience for me to see that, that just even though they were on opposite sides, they could still shake hands. And it's not necessarily that they changed their attitudes, they still were who they were, but that they could set that aside, at least for that moment, and shake hands. And, you know, obviously the war had been over for 75 years, but uh, that there can be a healing of some sort. And then taking that forward to today, uh, shall we hope, it was, uh, you know, there was a woman named Phyllis Wheatley, who was an enslaved African, who, um, who wrote poetry. She, she was in Boston, her, her uh, people who bought her, uh, taught her English and taught her, she came from Africa when she was 13 years old and she wrote a poem, she wrote poetry, one of which was uh, sent to George Washington who wrote a letter back to this woman, Phyllis Wheatley. And uh, anyway, in one of her poems, the, the phrase, shall we hope was in there. And uh, I decided that should be the title of this album. And it's, despite all of our divisions today, we're all in this life together and i don't mean to be getting up on a soapbox or anything but it's really true you know every single person has value and and no matter what our political views or about anything we're all you know we have the same struggles and the same sorrows the same joys and if we can re just feel the humanity in each other and respect that i think we can get past a lot of the divisions that we have now and this, of course it's a it's a hope it's not a reality at this point, at least not on a widespread level, but I think we can we can just get to recognize, as I say, the humanity in each other. And I think that's, if there's any message to be gotten from the album, that's what it is. I think, uh, I don't think I could ever say it better myself, really. Um, I think that's, that's extremely uh, accurate. It's almost as though, uh, shall we hope should be, we shall and we should hope, right? Um, that, that's the way to go. It, it, can't say it better than that. Thank you for your ever so wise words. A curiosity, when you get into researching for these kinds of projects, I mean, there's a lot of work that went into, into these. I mean, you obviously you, you delved very deep. What does that involve for you? I'm assuming it's not a quick Google search and that you're spending quite a, uh, a profound amount of time uh, digging deep into these into these history books. What, what does that look like for, for Tony? Well, it's, there are some history books. My dear friend, Ben Hirschman, um, mm. gave me five years ago, six years ago, a, a series of books about the Civil War. It's like an encyclopedia of photos, a lot of photos, but also, of course, text um, about the Civil War. The book dates from like 1907 or something. Wow. And so I, I researched through that a lot. So a lot of things came from that, but I was Googling things also, and that's, uh, or on YouTube, I found that reunion of Civil War soldiers. Um, but I got uh, an important aspect of the album is uh, I found in a banjo book, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, it might just be called the banjo, and forget the author is, I'll say French, I think. But I was just leafing through that and found a description of an enslaved uh, a burial ceremony because I wanted to, this main character, John Boston, from when I went to this graveyard in Asheville, he was a grave digger and I decided I wanted to recreate an enslaved uh, burial ceremony. And in fact, I went to the, um, uh, the African burial ground 
in southern Manhattan, which was unearthed 20, 25 years ago, something like that, while they were building some high rise of some sort. And I uh, went down there and spoke to the historian who didn't have that much information on it. They had a film about a burial, but it was not, again, in great detail. But in this banjo book of all places, it described how the percussion instruments that would be played, which would be a box of sand or a box of pebbles, actually, that would be shaken, uh, a jawbone from an actual animal uh, that you'd scrape mm-hmm. a stick across the teeth and um, hand clapping, perhaps, and, and people walking around a burial mound. And uh, the, the burial, burial mound would have objects on it reflecting the life of that person. And there would be these seashells on there also uh, reflecting the hope that the soul would return to Africa over the sea. This was all in this banjo book of all things. And so I was able to recreate that uh, thanks to a woman named Catherine Russell, who's one of the all time greatest singers in the world, who um, I've become friendly with. Uh, She's sung with all sorts of amazing folks and has her own career singing jazz uh, at Lincoln Center and various places. But I had her, uh, she, I found, I could go on about this, but uh, I found a description while I was researching this of a, a captain of a black regiment in the 18, 1862 or three, who had lyrics to songs that his men had sung. There was no music, but I found a lyric about a burial uh, ceremony uh, called I See Moonrise, I know, I know Moonrise. And Catherine wrote music to it and sang six parts to it. And I had her play the percussion instruments, including the jawbone. And I had her, uh, we, we recorded her walking in place. And that would be people marching, not marching, but walking around this burial mound uh, during the ceremony. So I recreate this uh, on the album, uh, which is one of the most powerful parts of the album for me personally. So yeah, just uh, many different threads were brought in into play. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it's really good, and, and we should encourage people. Let me see if I can uh, pull up a, a picture of the cover here while we're talking. But um, definitely, this is available on uh, your website, tonytrushka.com, where you can right. stream it and hopefully eventually um, uh, get CDs for those who are still using CDs. There it is. Um, and it, am I right in saying it's on uh, Spotify and Apple Music and and uh, all those other cool hippie hippie hip <laughs> places i should say yeah it's on chef records s-h-e-f-a chef records uh and uh, the owner was very generous with his budget to allow me to make this exactly the way i wanted to make it i never had to oh we're running out of money i better not do this it was he just funded the whole thing which was like i'll be forever grateful to ed haber for doing that and my son designed, designed the cover and the artwork and the the picture you're seeing there is from the 18, well, that's the, it depicts the Battle of Gettysburg uh, mm-hmm. from Harper's Weekly from 1863. Uh, but my son did the uh, the uh, cover work, you know, in the inside right. the booklet. And the uh, font for Shall We Hope is taken from, I, I found some Civil War fonts, you know, while researching uh, mm-hmm. from that time. And that's where that font is from. It looks distressed because it is <laughs> from back then. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I love the the artwork's fantastic. I I miss the days of being able to kind of, you know, take an album and open up the sleeve and look at the artwork, and now it's all digital. I'm right. old school. Like David mocks me because I don't stream or shop or uh, Spotify. Um, <laughs> I don't. I'm old school I, like, also. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like to own music. <laughs> <laughs> I like to pay. I like to pay your artists for it as well. I know how much uh, uh, what the cut is on on Spotify. It's not. It's not I incredible. Think it's at the- Point oh 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 one. Yeah, so, yeah. You need, need like two yeah. trillion plays to get that, that check, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, well, uh, there's one last question. If I'm, I'm going to switch gears real quick, there's there's a, a question uh, from Tom uh, in my other chat room over here, um, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up with some other stuff. So uh, he asks, what does Tony's live rig consist of? Uh, pickups, banjo mics, DIs. Can you give a real quick rundown for anyone coming to see you uh, play this year? Of, yes. So what uh, I have no rig. Uh, I used to have an electric band back in the 90s and for about three years. And I had all sorts of pedals and all these things. And then a chord would go wrong. And I, anyway, and I'm not playing electrically anymore. So I'm really just using uh, mics. And I don't have a particular mic that I use. It's it's. Uh, I'm very uh, low-key tech-wise, low-tech, I should say. 
um, mostly what, whatever is there. Uh, I do have a, once in a while, I've got a, uh, I've got a clip on mic that clips onto the, um, onto the flange, which is, uh, I won't mention the name because it's a competitor, but uh, it works really well. I, I had a chance to play with the Allman brothers, sit in with them because I got friendly with their bass player, Otil Burbridge, who played some banjo. And we got together and played a little banjo stuff. And then he said, oh, do you want to sit in with the Allman brothers tomorrow? And that wouldn't be so shabby. And I had never tried this mic out. And uh, and I just, you know, it's just like a little gooseneck thing on it. And went out there, did a line check about five minutes before the show, literally three minutes before the show started. And then I had to wait an hour to go on. And I was like, oh, my God, is this going to work? It was at the Beacon Theater in New York. And it worked. So, <laughs> so nothing fancy, but that little mic uh, saved my life. Hey, sometimes it's those things that help, right? That's right. awesome. And then lastly, uh, Peter is asking, do you have a favorite Bill Keith song? Favorite Bill Keith song? Uh, yeah. Well, probably my favorite. It's not his song that he wrote, but, um, well, Salt Creek is, you know, just from hearing that when I was a kid, yeah. it just made a huge impact on me. On me. And again, that's... I, I guess he I guess he has a co-write with it with Bill Monroe, but it's it's based on a tune called Salt River. So that but then uh he recorded with Frank Wakefield and Red Allen on a, a tune called um New Camp Town Races. And his solo on that changed my life in some ways. It was just like because I knew he played the melodic style. <laughs> Stream, but New Camp Town Races was he kind of invent, reinvented the vocabulary of the banjo. And it was just glorious, and his tone was unbelievable. Should I play a little bit of it? So yeah, it sure. Well, I mean, do you want to play it on the way out? And then we can uh, uh, we can wrap this up. Um, one other thing on the way out first, but okay. I'll just play it one time too, if that's okay. Go for it. Yeah. He had a profound influence on my playing. It was a, it was a good friend too. But this lick, Bill Keith brought the ninth chord to the banjo, and then this lick, it was just filled with this, all this amazing music. That's too cool. Yeah, Very it's a really cool. cool. But I thought I might go out with the Pete Seeger tune. Or arrangement anyway yeah it was one of the most optimistic people you could ever hope to find yeah we're going to end, end on some positivity right and on some optimism and some hope and uh exactly. so before before we do that let's say a big thank you to our wonderful friends at artist works thank you to john and, and patricia and, and everybody uh at artist works today and just a reminder for anyone watching um there is a discount code there during 25 25% off a 12-month plan to Tony's school on artistworks.com. Now, this does expire on Sunday, I am told. Um, so you've got a few days to think about it, but we'll drop that code in the YouTube link uh, right after the show. Um, take advantage if you can. All right. Uh, Tony, any final words of wisdom before we part ways? We will miss you until next time. I will miss you folks, too. It's been great. And thank you to you daring folks, and thank you to your artist works And just... Um, in keeping with my thoughts about, you know, recognize, recognizing each other's humanity, I was, my wife and I had dinner with Nora Guthrie and her husband last night. That's Woody Guthrie's daughter. Yeah. And she was talking about Woody and she's been the um, keeper of the flame for him. And, uh, you know, his archives and all of this. And uh, there's a new book of his drawings and, and writings. And 
uh, in there, she said, there's what he would do is he would write about people he met, never thinking that they'd ever get published, just he would write about them because he was a wonderful writer. And he wrote about some gentleman who was uh, like a dishwasher or something in, um, in Topeka, Kansas, something like that. Just some person he met, spent five minutes with or 20 minutes with, and wrote a whole thing on that. And just how Woody would recognize the humanity in everybody. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, people should check out Woody's writings and music. And uh, he's a good, good role model, at least in terms of his, uh, his ideals. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the wonderful words of the great Joseph Brusk, all men are created equal, but banjo players are cooler. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard and that phrase before. I think, I think that's a good place to, uh, to wrap it up. <laughs> I'll, I'll go along with that. Tony, you want to, uh, you want to see us out here with a, with a wonderful, what are you going to play for us? To, to, to see this? this is a, uh... An arrangement by Pete Seeger of Irving Berlin's Blue Skies, and it's on Pete's um, album uh, Goofing Off Suite. And as he, I talked to him about it one time, it, was, it came out on Folkways Records in 1955, it's still available on Smithsonian Folkways Records. And uh, as he said, he had bought this house with his wife Toshi. Uh, they, they bought land in uh, just south of Beacon, New York, overlooking the Hudson River, and they built a log cabin there. And uh, while well, he said, well, once they built the cabin, uh, while Toshi was putting in the electrical system and the kids were uh, tiring the driveway, he was hanging out in the hammock, noodling on the banjo, and those noodly tunes became the basis for this album. Uh, so, uh, and Pete was a wonderful banjo player. We did a show with him a few years before he passed. He was 90 at the time, thereabouts. And I said, do you still play Blue Skies? And he said, I don't. I only know ten banjo songs anymore, which I don't know if I believe that, but that's what he said. <laughs> and one of them is "Blue Skies," and he played it for me, and it was unbelievable. He could play it, and I'm going to play it for you now. And this is virtually note for note the way he played it. I transcribed it. This is nothing modern. This is nothing for me. This is from 1955. Pete Seeger. For people that always think of Pete as, as a strummer uh, or doing the basic strum, uh, this is his stuff, his arrangement. And it's, it goes from Blue Skies into more of a swing kind of a thing. So anyway, this will be Pete's version of Blue Skies. And I want to thank you gentlemen and all of the Deering folks and all the Artist Works folks. It's been a joy to be here. Absolutely. Tony, thank you so much right. for your time today and uh, looking forward to hearing this. Okay. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> Thank you.